Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this live stream presentation, Local Conservation Efforts at Bandelier National Monument with Katherine Brooks. Um, I am Krista Tyson with Pajarito Environmental Education Center, a nonprofit that runs the Los Alamos Nature Center located in beautiful Los Alamos, New Mexico. And I will be the moderator for this evening's talk. Um, the Los Alamos Nature Center is currently open to the public five days a week, offering many ways you can interact and connect with nature. Check the PEAK website, peaknature.org, for more information about our on-site and off-site live streamed or in-person presentations. We'll send you an evaluation form after the talk using the email that you use to register for this event. Um, and we'll use your comments to improve future program. So thank you in advance for filling out that survey. Uh, I'd also like to thank our wonderful members and donors. Um, we're able to offer programming like this because of your generous support. Um, and that's it on my end. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn audio on for Maya. She's one of our young adult volunteers, and she's going to do introductions for the presenter and talk a little bit about a young adult advisory group. I'm trying to find Maya in the participant list. Just a second. Here we go. OK, hello. My name is Maya Price, um, and I'm a PEAK volunteer with PEAK's Young Adult Advisory Group, or YAG. Tonight's program is being brought to you by the Young Adult Advisory Group, a group of volunteers working to connect young adults with PEAK, advise PEAK staff on how to support young adults, and develop programs for young adults ages 16 through 25. We work to incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion into our programs and exhibits and connect young adults with nature. If you're interested in joining PEAK's YAG group, please let us know in the chat box. And now to our program, I'd like to introduce Katherine Brooks. Katherine Brooks is a JMS intern working at Bandelier National Monument. She graduated with a degree in marine biology in 2019 from the University of Rhode Island and has worked a variety of positions since graduating. These opportunities have brought Catherine all over the country and the positions included environmental education, marine mammal husbandry at an aquarium, shellfish farming, and scientific research. In her free time, Catherine loves to go hiking, running, adventuring, and being outside. Awesome. I guess that means I should start. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Welcome. Um, I'm shaking in my boots a little bit. This seems super crazy that I'm giving a presentation over Zoom. So <laughs> bear with me. I hope to make it as smooth as possible. Um, I will share my screen now. Uh, I believe my screen is shared. So Let's get to it. So my presentation is local conservation efforts at Bandelier National Monument. Oh no, my bar went away. Woo. Um, at Bandelier National Monument, the intern experience. Um, so yeah, I was an intern this summer and I'm still here actually until next Friday. So a little bit about me. Um, I graduated from the University of Rhode Island in 2019 with a bachelor's in marine biology. So obviously coming to New Mexico was clearly the right move where there's a lot of desert and mountains. Um, I'm originally from a suburb of Chicago and I really like hiking and being outside. So again, New Mexico is a really great place to be because the possibilities are endless for hiking and such. Um, I love animals and field work, and I've worked um, in a variety of states and positions and with various different animals. Um, ah. All right, so here's me doing a bunch of cool stuff. Um, so over here, I'm, I hope you can see my cursor. I'm working a shellfish position, so I'm moving around oysters. Um, so that's like hatchery fisheries type stuff. In the middle, I'm holding, holding a nice striped bass. I was electrofishing by boat. Um, I have worked in marine mammal husbandry. So that is the bottom left. The center 
I worked a position in Mississippi doing dolphin photo identification. So that was really awesome. Another field position. Um, bottom right is me here at Bandelier um, doing invertebrate studies. And we got to do a backpacking trip for that. So that was awesome. Top right is salamanders because I've done some salamander work. Um, part of my position here at Bandelier was also salamander related. And in the middle, you can see me with a nice pipette. Um, I did some lab work working on bacteria on algae for probiotic properties and shellfish hatcheries, trying to prevent um, vibrio proliferation in, in hatcheries. So that's enough about me. Um, one second. Oh. All right, so tonight's topics, we are gonna get to beavers, the Rio Grande cutthroat trout, bird banding, and a little bit more of how, what is natural resources? How do I get a position in, that, in natural resources? So um, there's a very cute beaver picture. Um, we have a woodpecker in the top right, the Rio Grande cutthroat trout, and then me as an intern with my, co my intern coworker and my boss um, on a backpacking trip, so. Let's hop to it. Ooh, ah. All right, so beavers are large semi-aquatic rodents. They spend more time in the water and on land and than on land. And they're actually quite awkward as they wobble around on land. They um, can hold their breath for up to 15 minutes and they are the largest rodent in North America, weighing in at 35 to 65 pounds. They're the second largest in the world after the capybara, which is not native to North America. They are herbivores that eat leaves and woody stems um, and the bark of trees such as willows, um, other aquatic vegetation as well. Their building material also happens to be their preferred foods. Um, their tails are very unique. So when you think of a beaver, I'm sure their tail is one of the main things that you think of. Um, it's used to balance when they're on land or as a rudder when swimming and can be used to help signal danger um, if it's left on the water. So they're, Tails also act as fat storage for over the winter when food may be scarce. Um, orange teeth. Their teeth have a different chemical makeup than ours. So their enamel is made out of iron, which helps keep them strong for um, cutting down trees and is also the reason they appear orange. So that's super cool. They actually are, if you look up a picture of them, I apologize that I don't have one, but if you look them up, they look like I don't know, carrots or something, it's crazy. Um, beavers utilize their resources and their habitat to create dams and their home, which is called a lodge. They use sticks, reeds, rocks, and mud to create this lodge and their dam. Um, a lodge provides protection from predators and can be accessed on land and underwater, which is a good um, escape for predators because they probably won't wanna follow the beavers into the water. Um, summer and fall are typical building seasons for a beaver, and they also collect and store food for winter. So they have been busy this um, fall for sure. Um, beavers are nocturnal, which means they're most at, mostly active at night. So when they're foraging for food and building their dams, it's primarily at night. Um, communication, they communicate through various vocalizations, postures, and use tail slaps to avert others to potential dangers. Which I had mentioned before. Um, scent marking is also used to establish a beaver's territory, letting others know they're not welcome. Beavers are thought to mate for life and they breed in winter, giving birth in the spring. Um, and their young are called kits and they live 10 to 12 years in the wild. Um, so next I will jump into some beaver history here at Bandelier. The beaver on the left is one that we actually released this year. And the one on the right is from previous years. Um, so in 1955, there was a recorded established beaver colony here in Bandelier in Frijoles Canyon. By the 19, um, or shortly after that, beavers were extirpated from surrounding areas. Um, hunting and trapping of beavers for their pelts was the cause of their decline. Um, the fur was widely used as a clothing accessory, which is quite unfortunate. Um, after the 1950s, there was potential beaver presence here at Bandelier, but 
there it was not well documented so it's hard to tell so it's unknown when the beavers in frijoles officially left or were killed or, or just died so we, we're not really sure about that um Catherine, i have a question oh. Oh, okay. Sorry. My chat, my like sidebar nope. went away. <laughs> That's okay. I have it so that all the, the questions are coming straight to me so that you're okay. not distracted by the, the chat button lighting up. Um, and if it's still okay with you that I interrupt you during a pause, then I'll continue to do so. So thank yes, you. Absolutely. Um, so this question is from Mark. He said, thank you. I'm not sure if it's true, but it makes, oh, Sorry, let me go back. Mark asked, is the sad rumor that beaver's anal glands are somehow used for chemical, for a chemical used in vanilla ice cream actually true? Um, I've heard that their oil is highly coveted. I'm not entirely sure what that would be used for exactly, but I do know that their oil was another reason that they were hunted. Sorry, I couldn't answer that more thoroughly. <laughs> oh, that's perfect, thank you. Awesome. All right, so continuing to more recent times, 2018, um, we have done, a, a Bandelier has done habitat surveys in Frijoles Canyon. This means that staff at Bandelier walked up and down Frijoles scoping out potential habitats for um, um, re relocated beavers. Uh, wait. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> Um, so, um, and then in, also in 2018, beaver ponds were constructed in Upper Frijoles, which is where they found in their surveying to be the most um, suitable for a beaver because it had an unburned stand of forest and intact wetlands. So these beaver ponds were built by people in hopes that it would help jumpstart newly relocated beavers when they were brought to the park. So fast forward to a couple months ago, August, 2021, and we had two beavers released a couple miles up from the visitor center. And then actually fast forward now to December, 2021, and we have released eight beavers this year. So that's really, really exciting because we've been trying since 2019 and overall 25 beavers have been released, but it's super hard to get beavers recolonized in an area. So it takes a lot of repeats of trying and just like, really hoping that, that some of them will stick. So in October, 2021, we had confirmed beaver activity. We happened to have a new beaver pond, as you can see over by the pictures on the right. And that actually started to cross over one of our hiking trails. So it was, it became apparent very fast. Um, and since then we've been monitoring them, which has been extremely exciting. Um, so where do our beavers come from? Our beavers are a nuisance to some, but they're welcomed here at Bandelier. They are trapped by the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish and are brought to Bandelier. These beavers cause a variety of problems for landowners in a couple different ways. They can dam up a stream, a river, or a culvert, causing flooding over time or very quickly with heavy rains. The beavers eat and use trees to build their dams and lodges, so tree damage and unwanted tree cutting may not be favorable by landowners. Instead of trapping and killing these animals, though, they are able to find a new home here at Bandelier where they're given a second chance at life. Hooray! So um, many of our beavers come from Taos area and are released in the riparian areas of the Bandelier wilderness. When they arrive at Bandelier, they are hiked up the canyon um, on foot by people <laughs> to a predetermined location that is suitable habitat for a beaver. So we're always very excited when we hear that we can help save, save a beaver that's just being a beaver. <laughs> and why do we need beavers? Well, they are a keystone species, which means a lot of other animals benefit from their work, basically. They can modify and create a completely new ecosystem just using the resources they have around them, which is why they're considered a keystone species or another term, an ecosystem engineer. Um, other animals rely on the habitats they create and the stream areas would be completely different without them. Um, from experience just now, Frijoles Canyon has changed over the past couple months and that's such a short amount of time. So it's pretty incredible to see the work that these beavers have accomplished in such short time. Um, these 
dams create ponds that benefit the beaver and are habitat for fish and other aquatic life and provide food and water for larger mammals. Dams also reduce erosion by forming slow moving ponds and create wetlands that help filter toxins and benefit riparian plants. Beavers also help improve, improve channel flow and the movement of streams. So the pictures we have here are a little bit hard to see, but I tried to put the arrows to be very helpful. Um, in the top picture, we have two bears that are wandering around the beaver pond. In the bottom picture, we have two deer, and that big black and white picture is a raccoon that is actually, it was a video, and this raccoon is fishing, but I couldn't get the video to work, so you have a nice picture. <laughs> Catherine, I have two more questions. Sure. Um, you seem like you're at a pause. Mm -hmm. um, Joe wanted to know, how do you release beavers? Um, so I will get to that in, okay. a, in one of the next slides. So I'll elaborate it shortly on that. If that's and then um, another guest had a comment. You have spoken of Frijoles Canyon. What about Alamo and other canyons to the south, to what extent will they travel? I, they, they are mobile since they do have legs, they're not bound to water, but for them to get out of free holes would be pretty difficult. Um, I, I would say, I don't actually know, we haven't reintroduced anything into Alamo or Capulin or any of the other canyons. Um, and then for them to get down to the Rio, they would have to either take the falls trail or go over the falls. And I don't think that would work out very well. So basically we're just reintroducing them to an area that we know to be suitable habitat. Um, but that's not to say that they couldn't potentially live in other areas. Thank you. And um, I don't, you, you may be talking about their natural predators later, um, but that is another question that came through. Oh, that's good. I actually didn't include that for some okay. reason. Do <laughs> beavers have natural predators at Bandelier? Um, one big one would be mountain lions. So um, we don't actually have any like recorded camera footage or anything, but it's likely that if there was the opportunity, a mountain lion would definitely snag a beaver as a snack. So that's definitely one of their predators. Um, any more questions at the moment? Not right now, thank you. Okay. All right, so this is the fun part. Um, this has to do with really releasing the beavers. So as an intern, I helped pick up the beavers from the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish, which means I drove about half an hour up to Española, picked up this beaver and had a big bucket of water to dump on it to keep it cool. And we rushed it back to Bandelier and Ideally, finding coworkers or people to help you hike this beaver up canyon is a really, really good, good thing because they are heavy, 35 to I think what it was, 65 pounds. Some of those can be massive. Um, so that's a picture of me with a beaver on my back. Um, so their transport upstream is human mules. <laughs> Um, so it's actually pretty fun. Um, they do move around a little bit, so it can be unsteady. And this picture is of, with the beaver uncovered. Um, but when we walk up with the beaver, we try to cover it with a sheet to keep um, its stress levels down as much as possible. And to um, people are very curious, so we wouldn't make it very far very quickly if we were constantly showing people our beaver. <laughs> um, other things I did as as an intern would be to monitor the beavers. So using wildlife cameras that are positioned around our beaver pond, um, we have several of them. So those get checked about once a week. We get video footage and pictures, and then those are brought back to the office and analyzed for various things. Like how are they doing? How many are there? Are they working? Are they building? Like, what are they doing? So those have been really, really fun videos to watch because they are so dang cute. <laughs> Um, other things include observations of the area, and that would be my bottom picture, and that is the, um, the typical thing you see when beavers are in the area, a chewed, a chewed tree. Um, not super easy to see, but if you think of beavers and you think of that pointed kind of end of a limb, that's what that is. So constantly taking observations is a big part of that. 
Um, so here's recent work from the Beaver, Beaver Dam. Um, the arrow on the left is new dam that we spotted last week, actually. Um, I guess the beavers didn't like that the water was starting to escape out that way, and they, they sure enough dammed that up. So that is awesome. And then the arrow on the right is a big pile of willow that is just continues to grow in the middle of their pond. We speculate that it is food for the winter um, since it has continued to grow and hasn't been put in a dam or anything. Um, another point of view from of the beaver pond. So you can see there's various um, materials being placed in this dam. There's rocks, there's mud, there's giant logs, there's a lot of things that look like grass, but that's actually um, part of a tree. They just have stripped it completely of the bark. So it is about, I'd say the, the dam, um, the deepest part in the water is probably about three feet deep um, at its deepest point. And actually it keeps getting deeper. Um, we have to walk through part of the, the um, beaver pond to set up one of our cameras. So we are finding that it keeps getting deeper. <laughs> good thing for waders. Um, and this is another really good picture of the beaver dam. So all those grass, like yellow grass looking things, those are all, all sticks that have been stripped of bark because that's something that they like to eat. This dam is also probably at least three feet tall and continues to grow as the water um, continues to spill over. So it's really impressive to go and see what their progress is every week because it sometimes is very, very drastic and you can definitely tell they've been hard at work. Um, all right, so we'll, we'll jump into our next topic, the Rio Grande cutthroat trout. If you have any questions of beavers, we can go over them at the end. Um, so the Rio Grande cutthroat trout is actually the state fish of New Mexico. It's not listed as an endangered species, but it does face a lot of threats. Um, there are no early records of the fish found either in Capulin or Frijoles, but this area is within a historical range of the trout. So they are found in connecting streams. So it is likely that they were here in the past. We just don't really have any record of that. They are mainly found in headwater streams in clear cold water with high habitat diversity and high amounts of macroinvertebrates to feed on. And when I say a diverse habitat, that really refers to like undercut banks, debris jams, riffles, shaded or unshaded areas, and pools. Um, some of their threats are stream alterations. So fit these fish like cooler waters and with a lack of trees and riparian vegetation due to say wildfires or human in interference, um, the water is directly exposed to the sun and warms more easily. And this can reduce or completely eliminate trout habitat um, with too high of water temperatures. Populations can also become isolated or disconnected, causing a small gene pool. That means if they're breeding, um, there, there isn't enough people to go, not enough fish to go around. So that would lead to inbreeding and unhealthy populations. Um, and then climate change and habitat loss are go hand in hand. So the, the exact effects of global warming aren't known, but things like increased air temperatures, droughts, and changes in precipitation can potentially cause problems and again, reduce their habitats in the, in the future causing, causing problems. Um, so this is um, a picture of Frijole, Upper Frijoles Canyon, um, just down of Juniper, er, Juniper Campground. I'm sorry, that's definitely not right. But just from the campground, you walk down the switchbacks and then you hit Frijoles and you can walk down from Upper Crossing down Frijoles. Um, so we've, we've spent a lot of time in this river. <laughs> um, so a little bit about the history of the trout and the Rio Grande cutthroat trout in Frijoles. In the early 1900s, many fishes native and non-native were introduced to Frijoles Canyon and Capulin Canyon to promote fishing in the area. The introduction of these other species led to the demise of the Rio Grande cutthroat trout and they were ultimately extirpated from the stream. In 2009, macroinvertebrate st surveys start and 
This is important because this gives us a look at what is avail available um, for food for these fish and invertebrates can be a good indicator of stream health. Um, 2011 rolls around and Las Conchas fire has devastating impacts on the surrounding area and in Bandelier. Um, park, the park closed fishing and created, um, and these fire conditions created a lack of variety in the aquatic habitats. So that just means like we had a comparison. So prior to the fire, substrate was more commonly cobble and boulders and post fire it was more sand and gravel which is really not good habitat for invertebrates. And ultimately that means it's not good for the fish. I'll, I'll get into more details with that though. Um, in 2013, there were major floods and that also created a lot of damage and actually wiped out all of the aquatic life. The slate was wiped clean in terms of what was living in the stream, giving the National Park Service the opportunity to reintroduce only native fishes so um, the only problem was that the invertebrates were also eliminated by the flooding. So before fish could be reintroduced, the invertebrates would need to return to a healthy level that could sustain a fish population. Um, this is a picture of the flood roaring through the parking lot at the visitor center here at Bandelier. Pretty crazy. Um, so it was really awesome that there was information on invertebrates before the fire and flood because that was a healthy stream. Um, so post fire and flood invertebrate surveys were done again in 2014 to see what diversity and populations were looking like. The surveys had um, decreased from 600 to less than 100 invertebrates per square foot. Um, so that's part of our, our surveys. Um, we. Um, essentially use a quadrat and and survey a small area to account for the whole stream. Um, in 2018, invertebrates were deemed to be at healthy levels again and could sustain a fish population. Awesome. So 306 Rio Grande cutthroat trout were released into free holes. And again, in 2019, 114 more fish were released. So um, 2021, this summer, we did fish surveys with New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. And we actually only found seven um, individuals on our, in our surveys. We aren't sure what happened to all of the fish, but it is likely that environmental factors such as the droughts over the past couple of years had a really big impact. Um, droughts could create dry, obviously drier conditions, possibly shrinking habitat size for the trout. So there's more competition within the population for resources such as food or habitat. So as an intern, we got to participate in basically all the steps of this. Um, we participate in electrofishing surveys, which mean, which it just includes um, using an electro fishing like backpack and a, a node that sends an electric pulse through the water, which briefly stuns the fish. So we're able to capture them. Um, if you've ever been fishing, fish are very elusive and fast. <laughs> this makes it a lot easier. Um, after collecting the fish, we then inject the fish with a pit tag, um, which can help us identify individuals using a special pit tag reader. So it's kind of like microchipping your cat or dog. This little chip goes into the fish. And if you wave the pit tag reader over it, it'll beep and pull up the number of that individual. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's what I'm doing in the picture on the left. And another part of this process was doing invertebrate surveys. So invertebrates and fish go hand in hand because without the invertebrates, we don't have the fish. <laughs> um, these surveys help us determine if the stream is healthy enough um, to reintroduce fish. And some of the inverts also just signal how healthy the stream is. So that's, that's always very interesting. Um, and then fish reintroduction. As an intern, you would also get to participate in fish reintroductions, um, hiking the fish in and releasing them into the stream. We didn't actually do that this year, which is kind of a bummer, but that's all right. Someone will have fun doing that next year. Um, so 2022 has plans to release more native fish, including the Rio Grande cutthroat trout, chub, and native suckers. So that will be very exciting. Um, on to the next, um, bird banding at Bandelier. 
Um, it's a very hands-on activity and it is pretty important actually. So we'll start with why are birds important? Um, birds such as hummingbirds are pollinators going from flower to flower, um, dispersing different types of pollen and that helps, helps the flowers. Um, seed dispersers, not all birds eat pollen, so some eat seeds. So they eat the seeds and then inevitably those seeds end up somewhere else <laughs> down the line. Um, so they're important for that because that, that helps re with vegetation regrowth and then pest management. So if you're not eating pollen or um, seeds, you're eating pests such as maybe you're um, a falcon and you're eating mice or something like that, or you're a bird and you're eating pesky little bugs. There's a different, there's a type of bird for everything. <laughs> um, so why is bird banding important? Mostly because we get a lot of data from it. So we can help, we can tell migrational patterns, lifespan, population monitor, monitoring, growth or decline. Um, so what bird banding is, is we attach a tiny tag to the bird's leg, and this doesn't hinder the bird in any way, and it gives us, it has its own um, number code so that we can tell it from another bird. So if, if we're banding every year, we can potentially have um, recaptures, which means, say we banded a bird this year and we catch it next year, we're able to compare our notes from this year and see how the bird is doing next year. If, if, if it's healthy, if its wings look good, if it's multi and how old it is. Um, so that goes along with individual identification because um, body condition of individuals is a good indicator of maybe um, bigger problems if a lot of birds are not looking very great. Um, so again, drought could be really bad, um, lack of food, there was a big bird die off um, in the past. I don't know too much about that, but some of those birds that were collected were banded. So you could see who was getting impacted, if it was all older birds, younger birds, stuff like that. Um, but all this information can provide insight on areas that we need to focus conservation or restoration efforts. So if we're noticing that a lot of birds are migrating through a certain area or are in a certain lake, we would probably put a lot of our efforts to try to save those areas from being developed or polluted. So as an intern, we get to participate again in, in just about every part, every step of the process. Um, in the mornings, we set up our mist nets, which is um, a gentle way of catching these birds. Um, they're, they're almost invisible. <laughs> Um, to the naked eye from a distance because they blow in the wind and they're very, very, um, I don't know what the word is, hard to see, I guess, but the birds definitely can't see them. And so they, some of them are smart and fly around, but most of them will fly right into the net. That leads us to bullet point number two is net extraction. So the bird flies into the net. Well, you got to take it out. So we are instructed on how to take the bird out of the net and bird safety is number one. So we really have to be careful not to pull at their fragile wings or at their legs or anything like that. So that you, you need to get trained on that very, very um, rigorously so you don't mess something up. Um, I didn't really know much about birds prior to this internship. So I learned a lot of bird identification, um, sight and sound. We worked with some of the best bird banders and they are great teachers. So sight, sound, this is how you band a bird, all of that. Um, so yeah, bird banding is also part of the process. Um, you can see in the picture that, well, maybe you can't, but I'm holding a bird and using these plier type things that actually hold the bird band in it. And that's how we attach that. It just kind of clamps around, but not like a super tight bracelet or anything. It's more loose, kind of like a, a wristband um, for a human. Um, and then we all, collect data on individuals like do they have enough fat stored for winter how do their flight feather wings look are they molting are they young have we caught them before are they a recap so it was super cool to get to do all of these parts of bird banding and as someone who didn't really appreciate birds all that much I, I, I love birds now so this has totally changed my perspective and it's been incredible um 
so that is all I have for the different projects that we've worked on this summer. But now we can get into how do you get a position in natural resources? So I guess we'll start with what is natural resources? So natural resources is a big umbrella term and it has a lot of different things under it. So salamanders, turtles, birds, water sampling, rare plant, plant monitoring, um, air and water quality. Natural resources has endless possibilities to it. Um, these are just some examples. So there's a lot. <laughs> Um, how do I become an intern? Well, first step is applying to internships and jobs that interest you. Even if you feel like you're not qualified, still send in that um, application. The worst thing that can happen is you don't get the position, but at least you can tell yourself you tried. And that's, that's great because maybe you will get that job. Try to get outside your comfort zone. Apply to places all over the country and try something new. I had never, I'm a big outdoors person, but I had never backpacked. So that was kind of getting outside of my comfort zone. Um, so this picture is the first overnight that we did in the wilderness and it went really, really well and it was very fun. So don't be afraid to try something new. That might be a little scary. Another thing you can do is update your resume, proofread for errors, add your, volunteer add your volunteer experience and explain your responsibilities. Your resume is basically the first thing that your potential employer sees and you want it to be a really, really good, um, as best of a, what's it called? You want it to reflect you as, as much as possible. Other things you can do to stand out is call or email the hiring office, show you're interested, um, be friendly, ask questions. And practicing for your interview, never hurt anyone. <laughs> um, definitely practice can make perfect and a good interview can, give, can definitely get you a job. What resources are there to help me? So I have just, uh, I have some things that I always go to regularly, job boards, conservation job board and Texas A&M Wildlife and Fisheries Sciences job board are two job boards that I frequent. <laughs> um, USA Jobs is more federal jobs, but nonetheless, there are still opportunities out there. Um, some even have recent graduate opportunities, which is really awesome. And then indeed.com, sometimes it has really good jobs and if, if it doesn't, it, it'll lead you to USA Jobs. So they're kind of on both. More geared towards um, younger ages is Student Conservation Association, um, American Conservation Experience, AmeriCorps Conservation Legacy, Scientists in the Park, and GeoCorps America. Um, you can see in these pictures, um, me with my intern coworker and our boss. So that's been really fun. Local upcoming positions here at Bandelier are the Jemez Mountain Salamander Internship next year and the New Mexico Jumping Mouse Internship um, the following two years. So there's actually more information on these topics in tomorrow's presentation. Marissa is my coworker and she's really awesome. Um, our, the title of our position this year was actually the Jemez Mountain Salamander Internship. And as you can see from my presentation, um, we did a lot more than salamanders. So super cool that we had all these opportunities to, to cross train with different animals. The Valles Caldera also in New Mexico, right next to Bandelier, also has SEA positions in natural resources. And they do stuff with plants, they do stuff with mountain lions and um, jumping mouse. But again, natural resources, is an umbrella term. So you could, be, who knows what you'll be doing. Um, some final words that I'd like to give to people who might be unsure of natural resources. Um, don't give up. There are a lot of people who want jobs. And if, if you want one, just be persistent, apply, apply, apply. It might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but you'll eventually get a position and it will, you will feel so rewarded for all of your hard work. Use, utilize your free time, take advantage of your summer. That's 
three months where you have free time, you're not in school, um, try to volunteer, try to get a, a internship somewhere, anything will be good experience for a resume. Um, in, in interviews and in any type of volunteer or internship position, ask questions, try to learn as much as you can, show that you're interested. Those are all really good, good qualities to have. Um, standing out from the rest kind of includes all those prior bullet points, but be yourself, show you're interested and people like um, when you're genuine and such. If you're really interested, it'll, it'll show in your, in your personality. Um, don't be afraid to try something new. I mentioned that before. Um, try Go to a new location. Internships are really, really cool because you can try new things and internships on the downside aren't super long, but on the bright side, you can try a whole slew of different things before you're like, wow, this is what I can picture myself doing for the rest of my life. Um, working hard is also a must. You, I mean, that's standing out. You wanna work hard. <laughs> and one thing that you have to remember is you won't get your dream job right, right away. And that might be a hard thing to swallow, but you will try so many things on the path to your dream job and your dream job could change along the way. You will grow as a person, your interpersonal skills will grow, your technical computer and field skills will grow. And who knows, I mean, you'll eventually get that, potentially get that dream job, but you will have fun along the way and learn a lot. And that is all I have. And we do have some questions that I've been writing down as they've been coming in. Oh, I'm so uh, sorry. <laughs> no, no. Um, the way that the, that the questions were coming in, it's just perfect to wait till the end. So, okay. Um, and do you want your camera? Would you like your camera on for questions? Sure. Go for it. Uh, are you able to? Oh, All right. here we go. I have to admit, I looked up, I Googled beaver yellow teeth. <laughs> I wanted to see what it, what they looked at like, and you're right, it looks just like carrots. It is um, so crazy. <laughs> and then um, I, if I can sneak in a question, um, looking at the picture of you backpacking in a cage with a beaver on your back, it made me remember all the times I had to backpack in my I have three kids in an ergo on long hikes and how tiring it will get especially <laughs> if they were like um moving around what was your experience with that and um did the beaver rest and take a nap or was it like mm -hmm. wild and jumping around in its carrier so I had the opportunity to help hike two beavers up the canyon thankfully I had co-workers um because it's definitely not a one-person job um you'll be walking and sometimes you have to bounce going across a stream and it, it'll shift slightly and you'll be like slightly off to the side and like I don't really want to fall in the water. Um, it's definitely a really, really hard leg workout. <laughs> so just trying to stay upright as much as possible. Yeah, really neat experience that you were able to share that with us. Um, one of my volunteers brought this in. This was in her mother's backyard. So I awesome. wanted to show and tell this. Um, all right, so questions. How do beavers behave when humans come close to their dam? It's really hard to say because they are nocturnal. So, I mean, we've gone up every week for the past couple months and we have yet to see a beaver. Um, so I'm sure they just hunker down in their, um, in their lodge or it's possible that they're not even home. <laughs> so it's kind of hard to answer that question. Great. Um, what opportunities are there for volunteers who are not seeking internships or future employment? Um, and you did talk a lot about how working as a volunteer can help um, boost your resume for when you are applying for jobs or internships. And I'd just like to put a little plug that I know Bandelier has volunteer opportunities, but so does Peak um, Pajarito Environmental Education Center here. Um, we're a nonprofit that runs the Los Alamos Nature Center. So there's two places that mm -hmm. I know of that where you could volunteer. Um, but do you know of any opportunities for volunteer work at Bandelier? 
I don't know anything specific. Um, just like a generic volunteer thing, like definitely reach out um, to like the natural resource department. You can always ask like, hey, do you need volunteers? I'm sure they will say yes, because there's always stuff to do. Um, just generic or gen generally um, like animal shelters or like local nature centers, or I've done work at like a local farm that was historic before, not, not specific to Band Bandelier area, but ju just in general. So all those places that might have something outdoors or animal related. And um, Sarah just messaged me with her email. <laughs> Um, if you're interested in volunteering at Bandelier, so I'm gonna I'm awesome. typing that into the chat right now, and I'll also put my email in there for anyone that's interested in volunteering with um, with Peak. Definitely both really good places to volunteer. I'm not biased or anything, but. <laughs> and I don't see any more questions coming in at the moment. Anybody else? We have a lot of thank yous coming in. It was an oh, excellent you. presentation. Thank you for bearing with me. I know I stuttered a few times and you hopefully, did great. <laughs> hopefully um, you all enjoyed it. Lots of pictures. <laughs> and this will be updated, or uploaded to our YouTube channel. So give us a week or so before you see that live on our website, peaknature.org. Um, tomorrow night, we have threatened and endangered species from seven to eight. So if you'd like to register for that, you can also um, do that through our website, peaknature.org. Marissa and awesome. here comes my email and Sarah Milligan's email for volunteer work. If only I was a quicker typer. All right. Um, all right, um, one more question. What was your favorite part of your internship? I always ask my kids, what was your rose from today and what was your thorn? So what was your rose? And you probably don't have any thorns because everything. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to say. Um, the internship has evolved over the summer like we did a lot of salamander work and then it kind of evolved to birds and then beavers and so depending on the time of the summer I'd have a different rose um I think just how versatile the whole internship has been just I mean that's not really answering your question but I'm trying to say the whole I mean it's been great to work with all the different animals and have so much time outside so I think just being outside for almost all summer was probably my rose. <laughs> um, the thorn could be, I mean, office work, but has to be done. So, <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. And I also want to thank Maya. Um, she's a volunteer with our young adult advisory group. Thank you for um, helping to put this together and for hopping on to do introductions today. And I also see some of our volunteers and members that joined in today. So thank you for your support and for hopping on. And that's it. We're all set. Have a good night, everybody. And we hope to see you out on the trails. <laughs>